Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the first lecture and this is an overview of the plastics industry. Uh, this is a two-part lecture so lecture one has a part A and B so please remember to watch both parts. There will be a short quiz over both parts. Uh, the second quiz will be pretty easy but we'll talk about that in the second video. So this is an overview of the plastics industry uh, and how thermoplastics kind of relates to that industry. So this is the outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, plastics industry, application of plastics in today's world, plastics in the environment and recycling, plastics processing and plastics testing. Uh, I'll tell you right now that when it comes to the processing aspects of plastics, that is not my forte and I won't focus on processing at all. Um, that is for other professors in this department, they, are mu they have much greater expertise than I do, so I will simply touch on the type of processing you can do with these plastics as opposed to the uh, discrete steps of processing. Like I said, that's, that's not my area. However, uh, when it comes to testing and the materials, that's what we'll focus on. So, there are eight main polymer-based industries. Uh, you might be able to guess from my uh, very subtle indications that plastics is the largest of these polymer-based industries. I myself have worked in adhesives, coatings, foams, uh, rubber and elastomers, and composites. Uh, so, uh, and of course, plastics. So this is, but the plastics is the largest of the polymer-based industries from a commercial perspective. Uh, get used to seeing these history slides. You will see these history slides for each one of the materials we talk about. Uh, and the reason I do that is simple. Uh, when it comes to lots of different industries, uh, they go. They have been around for centuries. Uh, plastics is not one of the one of those industries. Uh, in fact, one of the first really commercially viable polymeric materials was vulcanization of rubber, and that was only in 1839. Now that may seem like a long time, especially to Americans, uh, but it really isn't, especially for the foundation of an entire industry. So another course that I teach, which is rheology, really only started in the early 1900s. So when you're looking at um, major aspects of polymeric materials, plastics is a really commercially new industry, especially when you compare it to conventional materials, which we'll talk about in the second, second half of this lecture. So some of the um, important commercial plastics. Really the first one was the vulcaniz vulcanization of natural rubber, and that was done by Charles Goodyear in 1839. That was followed by celluloid. Now cellulo celluloid is based on cellulose, which is a natural material. Uh, that was done by John and Isaiah Hyatt in the United States in 1869, and that is a mixture of cellulose nitrate and camphor. Uh, this is what the uh, Kodak based their um, uh, photographic film on. Cellulose acetate came about in 1908, and this is celluloid and acetic acid, acetic anhydride, and catalyst to make a less flammable material. Uh, it's 1907, and Leo Bakeland, where we first get the fully synthetic plastic, first completely uh, man-made plastic, and that was phenol formaldehyde. Now something to point out is phenol formaldehyde is a thermosetting resin, not a thermoplastic resin. Uh, so is urea formaldehyde that came about in 1928. When we first get the uh, first fully synthetic thermoplastic resin is in 1926 uh, that was developed at B.F. Goodrich. And the 1930s was a really big boom period for the thermoplastics industry in ramping up to World War II. So uh, we saw nylon developed by DuPont, polymethyl methacrylate developed by Roman Haas, and polystyrene developed by Dow. Uh, in 1939, uh, ICI developed low-density polyethylene. Uh, and then we saw this big boom having to do with the U.S. involvement in World War II. And that is when the U.S. synthetic rubber program started. Now remember, natural rubber is a natural product. It's a sap from rubber trees. So this is what we had kind of a problem in getting access to natural rubber trees because they mainly came out of the Pacific. And we had a little problem in the Pacific uh, in the uh, uh, period between 1938 and 1946. So the U.S. had to come up with styene butadiene rubber, and that led to a boom in uh, styrene production. And that also led to a boom in polystyrene production. And you can see the uh, explosion in numbers of pounds of polystyrene produced between 1938 and 1950. Uh, it was several orders of magnitude in terms of the uh, increase in production of polystyrene in the U.S. In the post-war period, there were a variety of breakthroughs, including uh, stereospecific catalysts, and it was, this was for the invention of high-density polyethylene. Uh, and this was developed and commercialized by the Chevron Phillips Petroleum Company, now known as Chevron Phillips, in Bartlesville, 
uh, Oklahoma. Uh, if you ever have a chance to go to their facility in Bartlesville, there is an American Chemical Society historical plaque out in front of their facility. Uh, high temperature thermoplastics were developed in the 1960s for aerospace applications. There were also a broad variety of metallocene catalysts developed by Exxon and Dow in the 19, early 1990s. When it comes to the plastics industry, it is the fourth largest manufacturing industry division in the United States. Uh, and this involves several different types of manufacturers. So resins manufacturers, film manufacturers, and pellet manufacturers, and also the finished product manufacturers. In other words, the people who are making parts from thermoplastics. When it comes to the consumption of resins in 2000, and yes, I realize that uh, at this point, these statistics can buy cigarettes, but um, this kind of gives you a frame of reference. Uh, polyethylene is produced in 2000 in 96 billion, that's with a B, billion pounds. Polypropylene was 50, PVC was about 50, and polystyrene is a little over 20 billion pounds. When you total up all of the thermoplastics and thermosets together, it comes to about 300 billion pounds. And when, it, when you look at how much thermoplastics accounts for, that's 200 billion pounds. Now, you may ask yourself, why do thermosets even have a role? They're only 100 billion pounds. They have specific properties that you can't get with thermoplastics. And if you go on to take thermosets, I'll talk about those more. But they do still have a role in the plastics industry. But when it comes in terms of thermoplastics, they account for over 200 billion pounds of global consumption as of 2000. That number, of course, is much higher today. Once again, in 2000, the U.S. plastics in industry employed more than 1.5 million people and had more than $330 billion in shipments, meaning it's an extremely lucrative industry for the United States economy. These are plastics jobs in Kansas and plastics industry shipments in Kansas. So 15,000 jobs and $3 billion worth of plastics industry shipments in 2000, which of course is, is only higher today. These are the 10 largest U.S. plastics and resins producing companies. You may have heard some of some of these. And yes, a wide variety of these are oil companies. Exxon, Shell, and Chevron Phillips, of course. They have access to crude oil. A lot of plastics are made from that crude oil. That's why they are major players in the plastic and resin producing industries. But you also see BASF, Formosa Plastic Group, Dow Chemical, Sibagagi, DuPont. So Dow and DuPont are the big chemical companies and you see things like Sabic and Monsanto. So these are huge multinational corporations uh, that do billions of dollars worth of business every year in plastics and other fine chemicals, crude oil, things like that. These are the variety of processes here at PSU, and again, I'm just going to name what they are. Uh, we do injection molding, uh, blow molding, rotational molding, vacuum forming, uh, extrusion, and these are all the thermoplastic processes we do here. Uh, in terms of thermoset process, we do compression molding, transfer molding, and composites. Um, and the injection molding and blow molding, we have a diff couple different uh, lines and a couple different types of that. And uh, we also have a couple different extrusion lines. So again, if you're taking processing one, that's where you're really going to get in depth with all of that. When it comes to testing, we have the ability to do this either here in the plastics department or at the research center. And so we do a wide variety of testing that are important to know for all the materials that we, you might be working with. That is impact testing, tensile testing, flexural testing, and compression testing. Tensile, flexural, and compression testing can all be done with the same test, often, and the same piece of testing equipment, which is a tensile tester. We also do solvent resistance, arc testing, heat deflection testing, heat and flame resistance, weatherability, we can also do morphology, in other words, look at the way it is, look, look how it looks on the microscopic level with electron microscopy. We can also do determination of thermal processes using uh, differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC, or thermogravimetric analysis, or uh, TGA. We will talk more about DSC and TGA in the lab, uh, but DSC can determine TG, TM, uh, and TC, so that's glass transition temperature, melting temperature, and crystallization temperature. And TGA is often used to determine uh, how much filler is in something and then what the degradation temperature is. That's for determining your upper use temperature. Plastics is a very versatile manufacturing material uh, because of the nature of the material itself, the chemical nature of the material, and that's why they have you sit through this course. Uh, these are synthetic materials that are made up of large molecules, also known as polymers. And in thermoplastics, they can be formed by heat and pressure, and these are mainly based on petroleum products. 
but that's not the only thing that's present in a plastic formulation. There are many additives and reinforcement that are necessary uh, for versatility and processing and properties. If you made a new polymer for every single uh, application, that would be pretty cost prohibitive. So fillers, colorants, plasticizers, stabilizers can be added to make a base polymer more versatile. Also, you can make it stronger by adding reinforcements like glass fiber, graphite, carbon, Kevlar, metallics, things like that. So um, it's a very versatile material for a wide variety of applications. Plastics themselves come in a variety of forms. Uh, liquids, this is often the thermosets that come in liquid form. When you're talking about, and so uh, same thing with the premixes, when you're talking about thermoplastics, you're often looking at powders, pellets or granules, and film and sheet. So uh, typically, a thermoplastic uh, process is going to involve pellets. However, some of them involve powders and some of them involve films and sheets. Again, you'll get more in-depth in processing one. The nice thing about plastics is, depending on the material you choose, you have a wide range of properties. So, in terms of optical properties, they can be transparent, in other words, you can see through them, or they can be opaque. Uh, they have good uh, resistance to chemicals, or they have low resistance to chemicals, and therefore are more biodegradable. Yes, plastics are biodegradable. They can be hard or soft, they can be rigid or flexible, and they can for serve as a thermal insulator or an electrical insulator. Generally, most plastics are insulating in nature uh, rather than conductive, but there are uh, uh, scientific advances being made in conductive polymers. While they aren't as commercially viable at this point, uh, the commercially viable polymers themselves are mostly insulating. The two families of plastics, as I've alluded to already, are thermoplastics. That's what we're going to discuss in this uh, uh, course. And thermoplastics can be heat softened, shaped, and cold hardened. So the curing process in a thermoplastic is really just cooling it down. And a good analogy to a thermoplastic is ice or wax. So say, say for wax, you burn the candle, it becomes liquid, you take the heat away, it resolidifies. That's essentially what a thermoplastic does. And uh, candle wax is a low molecular weight polymer. The other side of this coin are thermosets. These are plastics that will set permanently into a shape when you heat them or apply pressure. So think of this as like baking a cake. You put all the uh, ingredients together, you have a low viscosity mixture, you put it in a pan, you stick it in the oven, you heat it up. You can't unbake that cake when you take it out. You've got a finished cake. So that's what a th thermoset really is. So um, what, again, we're going to be focusing on thermoplastics and what you can do with that heat softened, cold hardened technology. If you're going to study something, uh, this is a good, really good slide, it's just action-packed. So when it comes to the major differences between thermoplastics and thermosets, this is what they are. Thermoplastics soften when they're heated and become more fluid as additional heat is applied until they can become essentially a liquid. Whereas when thermosets are heated, uh, they cross-link. Uh, this is often the case. Uh, curing process is completely reversible in a thermoplastic and it is not reversible at all in a thermoset. There are new technologies with thermosets that creates this, but that's not uh, the commercially available thermosets at this point. In a thermoplastic, there is no chemical bonding. Uh, but in a thermoset, there is chemical bonding. That's forming of crosslinks. Because there's no chemical bonding in a thermoplastic, they can be remolded and recycled. And they get their strength from high molecular weight, and it has the ab ability to crystallize their crystallinity. Thermoplastics offer high strength, uh, shrink resistance, and easy bendability, very flexible and they serve really well in low stress applications like plastic bags or under the right conditions high stress mechanical parts. When you're talking about a thermoset, their strength comes from crosslink density. Uh, they provide significant improvement over thermoplastics in certain areas because of their crosslink density. They have better mechanical properties, enhanced chemical resistance, enhanced heat resistance, and better structural integrity and resistance to deformation. Where they do not do well is they are not recyclable, uh, once you form those chemical bonds, they cannot be reversed, and they tend to be very brittle, uh, much more brittle than a thermoplastic. So thermoplastics uh, are, have much better flexibility. So I often say there's no bad material, there's just bad applications, and so part of the reason for taking this course is choosing the right material for your application, uh, armed with this information. Plastics have wide-ranging applications in pretty much all areas of modern life. Transportation, packaging, clothing, medical, construction, and the ubiquitous other category. Uh, but they're very, very widely used. In the automotive and aerospace industry, uh, they are used for body panels, uh, dashboards, bumpers, electronics, sealants, uh, electrical components for aerospace, 
insulated materials and canopies for aerospace. Very, very widely used. It is everywhere in consumer packaging, and it takes place of other things because it is shatterproof. It is also moisture proof. Any moisture inside the product is kept in, and any unwanted moisture is kept out. And this extends the shelf life of the food or the other material. It also has really good chemical resistance. If you have Drano in a container, you want it to stay in the container. After all, Drano is corrosive. Also, um, if you drop, say, an egg carton, you have a much better chance of avoiding breakage of the product, a delicate product. And because consumer packaging needs to be pretty to appeal to the customer, these can be made anywhere from transparent to opaque. So they can show off the product or they can hide it, uh, much like they do with Drano. Uh, I'm sure as you sit here, you're probably wearing something that contains some sort of polymeric fiber. And uh, in other words, if you're wearing some sort of poly cotton blend, that poly is polyester. So very widely used in cloth. Uh, pleather or Naga hide is synthetic leather. Uh, nylon rain gear, insulated materials, um, and when you're talking about the plastics used in textiles, you're talking about polyesters, acrylics, rayon, and nylon. And the reason for that is they have better properties than natural fibers. Washability, wrinkle resistance, color fastness, stain and soil release, and durability of the fabric. If anybody has kids, uh, you'll understand that durability is what kids can do uh, to fabric, especially in the area of stain and soil and durability. Uh, that's, it's amazing, and of course, they also need to be washable, especially in kids' clothes. Uh, the medical industry is, has, was transformed by plastics. Uh, the ability to sterilize and the ability to, to dispose of plastics is very important. Um, they're widely used in prosthetics, syringes and flexible tubing, uh, contact lenses, uh, templates for artificial skin, artificial organ components, and of course, disposable surgical gloves that provide a barrier uh, between the doctor and the patient for the reduction of transmission of disease and the development of things of controlled release. These can be drugs, these can be um, uh, things like that uh, in coatings, and these can often be applied in the form of a patch. And in the wide range of applications for construction, plumbing, pipe, showers, uh, interior walls, exterior walls, floors, countertops, and electrical boxes. Uh, widely used for electrical insulation, widely used for thermal insulation, uh, and any sort of area of the construction industry. Now one thing I will point out is that if you see this handy dandy little stop sign, that's where this lecture ends, and that's where this lecture ends. So we will pick up the second half of this introductory lecture in the next video.